in the Senegal River, they were complaining that the manatees basically raid their nets, and when the catfish are caught, the manatees come along and suck the body of the catfish off the the body, leaving only the head and the net, which certainly doesn't endear them to the fishermen. And so they were claiming that the manatees ate um, fish, which I had heard in several other countries as well. And I, I was a little bit skeptical until that place where these fishermen showed me the catfish, simply because in that place there were no other large predators. There were no crocodiles, there were no hippos, there were really nothing else, no big turtles that could eat these fish. So I was pretty sure it was manatees. So I did a technique called stable isotope analysis, which is a fancy way of saying I slogged through a lot of waterways collecting plants and anything that I thought manatees were eating, and then compared it to manatee bone, and basically through some analyses it tells me the percentage of um, different things in the manatee's diet. And so all the other things you see in the other pictures, um, different fish species, estuarine clams, and freshwater mussels turned out to be things that these manatees were eating in different parts of Africa. And in fact, in, in Gabon, in Central Africa, where they have a lot of plants available, their diet is about 90% plants and 10% mollusks. But in Senegal, their diet's 50% fish and, and clams and 50% plants. And it doesn't matter either the coast or the river. So they are true omnivores, they're not herbivores, and that's a huge difference from other uh, manatee species, and that also means that we have to think differently about what is important habitat to protect for them. I want to send out a special welcome to all the friends of, and family of Lucy and Tomas who are here tonight. Would you uh, <laughs> raise your hand for a round of applause for all of you. It's great to, great to see you. It's been Lucy, in particular Lucy, but also Tomas, we have, have a, lot of, a lot of roots in this area and history with the aquarium. And so all week I've been enjoying seeing um, many reunions from friends who haven't seen each other in, in a lot of years. So I am Elizabeth Stevenson, and I am the manager of the Aquarium's Marine Conservation Action Fund here at the Aquarium. And MCAF is a micro-granting program of the Aquarium's Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life that provides funding to researchers and conservationists and grassroots organizers all around the world who share in the aquarium's commitment to ocean conservation. And MCAT is truly a global program having funded projects in over 40 countries and across six continents. Projects such as a study of manta and mobile ray fisheries that led to stronger protections for these species on an international level. A program to recycle fishing nets into skateboards, sunglasses, frisbees, now office chairs, um, from the Boreo, Boreo um, organization that has kept almost 100 tons of fishing nets from being discarded into the ocean where they would entangle marine life. So these are retired fishing nets that um, are now being disposed of properly and given new life and positive products. A program to start the first ever marine mammal stranding network in the country of Iran. And the great projects you're going to hear about tonight to study and protect manatees and sea turtles in West Africa. Now in addition to providing financial support to these ocean conservation leaders such as Lucy and Tomas, the MCAF program also seeks to go beyond simply being a granting program and to build enduring relationships with these, with these conservation leaders so that we can support their success as agents of change over the long haul. Because it is a very challenging career to be um, a conservation leader and to stay in conservation long term or research. There's not a lot of resources out there. So we aim to do what we can here to support in a variety of ways um, these amazing people who are, who are really very self-sacrificing and, and doing good for, for all the rest of us. So we do that through our MCAF Fellows Program. And Lucy and Tomas are here as fellows tonight. And through the Fellows Program, we bring certain of our grantees, so some of the people that we funded, we bring them to the aquarium. And as part of this fellowship, they spend a week here engaging with our audiences, connecting with our scientists, this is a picture from just a couple of days ago of, of Lucy and Tomas meeting with our visitor educators who are, have a lot of expertise in framing conservation messaging for the public. And um, so we were talking about different communication practices and sharing their work in this is Africa versus here. 
We, uh, they also gave a great workshop today for teachers. We have a lot of teacher training programs here at the aquarium, and we have summer workshops, and Lucy and Tomas gave a great uh, presentation on their work for a very, uh, set of very interested teachers just this morning. Then there's a lot of fun stuff with kids where our fellows really are inspiring the next generation of ocean stewards through their work with our youth. And this is uh, Lucy and Tomas in our, our main building, our exhibit space with a booth that was just packed with visitors for like two hours straight coming to see the cool 3D printed leatherback skull that Tomas brought and the really neat um, manatee ribs that, rib, rib bones that uh, Lucy brought with her and, and to try on the very famous manatee costume that Lucy brought all the way over here with us. This is actually with our Harbor Discoveries campers. The other day we had 41 campers that um, Lucy and Tomas shared their work with these campers and then, then ran this great activity uh, that Lucy brought with her where they had to um, really run through the threats that manatees face in their, and their, the human threats that manatees face in their real lives, um, such as plastic debris and fishing nets and, and harpooners jumping out at them. So it was, it was kind of like a manatee haunted house, really. There was definitely some, uh, some excitement there and it made a huge impression on the kids and it was a much loved activity and great way to show the, what's, um, the threats facing manatees. And then uh, Lucy and Tomas also met with our teens, and in this case, they really shared their, their career path and the really advice they have for these, our teen interns here who are interested in careers in ocean conservation. And of course, we also brought out the manatee costume again, because you're never too old to wear a manatee costume. So, um, so before I introduce Lucy and Tomas tonight, um, I just wanted to say a thank you to our funders and of course our grantees and fellows who are the real heroes and that um, whom we feel incredibly honored to have the opportunity to support and to share a little bit in their journey um, towards ocean conservation successes around the world. I'm first gonna introduce Lucy and then she's gonna do her presentation and then I'll come back up to introduce Tomas because they both have very interesting and very impressive bios that deserve their own, their own moment. Lucy Keith Jine is from Massachusetts and has spent the past 29 years conducting field research with marine mammals around the world, including 18 years working with manatees, and has a wide range of field experience with endangered species, including penguins, sea turtles, the Hawaiian monk seal, and Floridian, Antillean, and African manatees. During her senior year of college, Lucy did an internship right here at the New England Aquarium's Tropical Gallery then worked at the aquarium as a staff diver from 1990 to 1992, and as a vet service technician in 95. She began studying African manatees in Gabon in 2006, and Senegal in 2009, and she has also studied the species in Angola, Ghana, Mali, Republic of the Congo, Guinea-Bissau, Cameroon, the Gambia, and Nigeria. Additionally, Lucy saw a critical need for information and training for African researchers throughout the range of the species. So in 2008, she initiated a collaborative network for manatee field work and conservation, which now has members in 19 African countries. To date, she has trained over 90 African biologists in manatee field techniques and conservation planning. She currently has great eight graduate students, I'm sure they are great, um, one PhD and seven masters studying African manatees. She was awarded the Manatee Conservation Award by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2003 and a prestigious Pew Marine Fellowship in 2017. Lucy is a member of ICE, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, Serenian Specialist Group, a co-chair of the African Manatee Regional Subgroup, and a member of the Convention of Migratory Species Scientific Council Aquatic Mammals Working Group. It is my honor and pleasure to um, turn the podium over to Lucy. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so happy to be here, and um, it's so much fun to have so many um, folks that I know, and, and also and people I don't know come <laughs> come to hear this um, talk about African mantis, which is of course my favorite subject, um, and um, mostly because people know so little about them. And so I'm really happy to be able to uh, give you guys some information this evening. And I would really like to thank uh, the New England Aquarium's MCAF Fellowship Program for such an excellent week here. We've had an amazing uh, time as Elizabeth said. So 
So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background about manatees because here in New England you don't really regularly have them except for a few that get lost and wander up here occasionally from Florida. Um, and so folks don't always know about all the, the manatee species that are out there. So um, on the upper left hand corner you have the Amazonian manatee which is the smallest species. Um, lives in the Amazon River and its tributaries. It's uh, black and it has a unique white belly patch that's kind of like a fingerprint um, so they can actually be individually identified by that belly patch. And then on the upper right side you have the West Indian manatee which is the one most folks here know because it's uh, divided into two subspecies, the Florida manatee and the Antillean or Caribbean manatees. The African manatee uh, is its closest cousin and lives throughout uh, West and Central Africa, and I'll tell you all about that guy. And then the dugong is a cousin. Um, they are <coughs> mostly a, they are completely a marine species. They don't need fresh water like the manatees do, and um, they have a tail like a dolphin and kind of more rubbery dolphin-like skin. So they are a distant cousin. And then the stellar sea cow, unfortunately, is no longer with us. It um, was hunted to extinction 27 years after its discovery in the 1700s. It lived up in the Bering Sea. It was the only one that was in colder water. It used to eat kelp and um, it obviously was a monstrous. <laughs> I think they were about 30 feet long um, and some shipwrecked sailors discovered them and they were hungry so they ate some and then when they were rescued they went home and told all their comrades and so these guys were hunted out. So unfortunately we don't get to see those guys today. <laughs> So for the four living species, they are um, throughout the world in kind of a belt across the tropics. Um, and you can see the West Indian manatee divided in purple for Florida and then the light blue in the Caribbean and up along the north coast of uh, South America. The Amazonian manatee obviously and then in yellow the African manatee. And then the dugong actually has the largest range from East Africa across through Asia and Australia. So zooming in on the um, African manatees range, it lives in 21 countries um, in West and Central Africa and this is kind of a simplified map because there are many, many, many other rivers that you don't see but these are the main ones and um, they can be found actually as far inland as um, up to 3,000 miles from the sea. So if you can find um, Kulikuro Mali in there, um, kind of in the center, um, we actually have a manatee sample from Kulikuro which is about 3,000 thousand miles from the sea. And after um, hunting and accidental capture in fisheries, which are the two largest threats for the African manatee, uh, isolation by dams is another um, important threat for them. So all major rivers in Africa today are dammed uh, with hydroelectric dams and so the manatees that are living in those rivers cannot move past the dams. And uh, additionally there are three new dams going into the Niger River so these populations are getting kind of chopped into smaller and smaller population segments uh, which is of concern because we actually don't know how many African manatees there are anywhere in their range. Um, we have a guesstimate of 10,000 but it really is a guess because they, the water is very dark and murky, they're very difficult to see and they're very shy because they're hunted. Um, I like to put this map in just because a lot of people don't really realize how big Africa is. This was a map created for The Economist magazine a few years ago um, by a map maker and it really is accurate. <laughs> so um, you know we can fit most of the other continents inside of Africa and um, when you think about the Florida manatee and you can find Florida on the US map it's just that peninsula and that's basically um, where most Florida manatees are most of the time unless they travel up and down the coast towards Texas or towards Massachusetts. Um, and then this is the range of the African manatee which is roughly the size of the continental United States. The Florida manatee has approximately a thousand people working on them if you count researchers and policy makers and law enforcement and uh, zoos and aquariums who rehabilitate injured manatees. And in Africa we have about 15 people working full time. So we have a lot of challenges um, but we are learning some things that 10 years ago we didn't know. So uh, little by little we're making progress but it is an immense area to cover. 
So these are some of the very few pictures that exist of the African manatee. Um, it's known as the forgotten Sirenian because it is the least studied. Um, and you can see in that top picture, the water's like chocolate milk, so they're often difficult to see. The first specimen for science uh, was collected by the French naturalist Michel Adinson at the mouth of the Senegal River in 1752. Of course, the Africans always knew they were there, but for um, science, that was the first one collected. And they're about two 250 centimeters long and weigh a maximum of about 880 pounds. So they are smaller than Florida manatees, which can get up to about 3,000 pounds. Um, their lifespan is about 39 years, and um, they most of their life history parameters so far are unknown because we're still trying to study them. So for example, we don't know uh, their age of sexual maturity, we don't know how often they ha give birth, we don't know how long the calf needs to spend with mom, um, we don't even know uh, home range size. So there's still a lot that we don't know, unfortunately. And when we look across their wide ranging habitat, uh, there's a, several different types of ecosystems that they live in. Up in the north, um, they live in the Senegal River, which is the picture in the upper left. Uh, that's actually a photograph taken from Senegal looking towards Mauritania. And it's very dry, we're at the edge of the Sahara, um, and that small river actually floods during the rainy season and becomes much wider. And mantis can swim out onto the grasslands and eat grasses and trees, but then when the river recedes and the dry season, they're limited to a very narrow body of water that doesn't have much plant life in it. And you compare that to the picture in the upper right in equatorial central Africa where everything's lush and tropical and green. They live in lagoons and they live in flooded forests and rivers where there's always plentiful food for them to eat. And then of course mangrove areas along the coast and seagrass beds also along the coast. So as I said, their two biggest threats are hunting and bycatch. Uh, hunting pretty much occurs throughout their range in Africa, even though they are legally protected in every country in which they live. And they are um, listed on the IUCN red list as vulnerable. Uh, they're also legislatively protected under CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species and the Convention of Migratory Species. But that's basically on paper. And unfortunately, um, the laws are seldom enforced on the national level within countries. Um, so we have uh, the bycatch you can see in the picture in the upper right is a manatee caught in a fisherman's net. I'm happy to say that uh, calf was actually released alive. And then um, the other large growing emerging threat is um, habitat destruction from human development. So we have a lot of ports and other things, um, just you know, more people living on the coast now um, that basically are, th are threatening their habitat. So how did I end up working in Africa? Well, it all began in 2006 when I was working with Florida and Antillean manatees for six years. And I went to Gabon in Central Africa at the invitation of a humpback whale researcher colleague who was working in Ngoe Lagoon in Central Gabon. And he, actually he was working in the ocean, but each day he would take his little boat out from that lagoon. And he said, you know, they, kept, they tell me that these manatees are rare in Africa, but I'm seeing them every day. There seemed to be a lot of them here, and we really need someone to come over and um, see if they can do something about studying them. So I went over to Gabon and boated around in a bunch of the different lagoons and found some manatees and kind of got hooked because to me it was a challenge. It's hard to find them, and I just kept wanting to know more and more. Um, and so I thought, this is a nice little country, you know, has some waterways, and I'll just do some boat surveys here. Um, and really, I was focusing in the green, the darker green areas, which are the national parks parks in Gabon. And so that was all well and good until I realized that this is the reality of waterways in Gabon um, because it's a sec central equatorial African country and um, I could pretty much spend the rest of my life and not get into all these waterways. So I did spend seven years boating around the country looking for manatees, um, trying to see as many of them as I could, trying to see where they were, their preferred habitats were. Um, were the national parks in the right places for manatees? Did they need other 
protected areas, talking to government people, um, doing surveys day and night, taking basic information. Gabon is a really challenging country to get around. Um, there's no roads outside the capital, really. There's some dirt tracks. Um, this is a picture of a, a truck that I rented, <laughs> so I had to return it. Um, and we had driven down dry riverbeds for three days and gone to these rivers where there's like some metal plates over some empty oil drums and I'm putting my brand new boat engine on this rented truck and praying that it actually makes it across the pull yourself across river. Um, so um, it was very challenging to do the field work there. And even when I got to places, pretty much this is what I saw. Some tail swirls and some pressure wakes with the Manatee way out in front or if I was lucky, a bubble trail in a shallow lake as the Manatee fled away. And then on the bottom, I, I would see feeding signs. So Manatees love to uproot plants to get at the nice juicy roots. And so for things like cattails, they will up, up root them and leave them there, um, or uh, they'll sort of mow through a flooded meadow, as you can see on the bottom right, um, leaving a trail of grass destruction. So we knew they were there, but it was very hard to see them. When we did, um, when we were lucky enough to find them, <coughs> we collected every sample that we could. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So. Um, when we had injured mantis that we'd rescue, we would take measurements, collect genetic samples, collect anything really that we could um, for dead mantis um, as well, uh, collect skeletal samples, collect the types of food that we thought that they were eating. And also around this time, um, early on in, in my time in Africa, I was invited to come do surveys in the Congo River in Angola. And this was a real eye opener for me because this is the first time I discovered that mantis were eating something other than plants. So all the mantis worldwide are considered to be herbivores and live on a diet of plants. But in the Congo, I discovered these villages where the entire villages are built on the clam shells that the people are free diving and harvesting. And the mantis are diving right along with them, eating the clams. And at first I had trouble believing it, but as I saw the mantis doing it myself, I became convinced that the that's what they were doing. But unless I can basically cut open a mantis, which I didn't, um, to see if there was clams inside, I was going to have to find another way. So a couple years went by, and this is me, the little red dot in Gabon, <laughs> thinking about 21 countries and how am I going to learn something about these animals in this overwhelmingly large area. And some of the questions that I had are, and still have actually, are how many distinct populations are there across this giant range? And how, um, how are the populations isolated by dam? Either are they in trouble? Are they not in trouble? Um, are they being hunted to extinction there? What impact does hunting have on all of these animals across these different countries? Because I felt like if we could answer these questions, we would actually have something concrete um, in order to direct conservation actions and hopefully save the most endangered populations. So in 2008, two things happened that really changed the course of my work. Um, number one, I started doing training programs for African biologists. I started out working with Earthwatch in Ghana, and we um, brought people from 16 different countries over two weeks, and we taught them everything. Um, we knew about mantis, myself, and a professor from the University of Ghana. And then when that funding dried up, I started raising my own money and leading my own training workshops in various countries over the year. And that's where I ended up training about 90 people uh, to study mantis. Not all of them have stayed with mantis research. Some have gone into fisheries, other biology biological disciplines or maybe even left um, biology altogether. But of that, we, we have about 40 people now who do something, about 15 of them full time. And the second thing that happened was my colleague in Florida, Dr. Bob Bondi, convinced me that I could pretty much spend the next 35 years in a boat trying to figure out something about these mantis, or I could spend four years doing genetics and learn a lot more about the population. And I am not a lab person, so I was thinking, this is a nightmare. I'm going to break lab equipment. Um, this is not really going to be for me, but I took a leap of faith and, um, and did some genetics work. 
So for the training part, as I said, we now have um, biologists trained in about 19 countries. Whether or not they're fully active is um, different in a lot of different countries. But um, one of, some of the things that I'm very proud of are that the, my former trainees are now training others. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of my colleague in Nigeria training some other folks during a manatee rescue. And then um, I have eight, as, as Elizabeth said, I have eight graduate students there in the upper right. Um, and they are working in Central Africa, in Gabon, Cameroon, and Democratic Republic of the Congo. One of them is an education master's student who's doing a lot of work um, with schools and educating children about the importance of not only protecting manatees, but all protected wildlife. She's the one in the manatee costume, actually. <laughs> and um, then the rest of them are all biologists. And uh, on the lower left-hand side um, is a group that one of my students taught himself um, to do manatee work. So I feel like there's a lot of paying it forward now. And as well, when we have people in some of these countries who know something and are learning about manatees, they're able to work to establish protected areas, such as a new site in Benin that's been protected specifically for manatees. And then for the genetics part, you know, people tend to glaze over. I'm not going to scare you all too much with genetics. But just to give you an example of some of the things that we found, um, we did, I did identify through my work two large populations, one in the north to the left of the red line, and then everything else to the right is what I consider the southern population. So in other words, um, when I took all of these samples and I ran them through analysis programs, 88 times in fact, um, every single time I would get that split right there. So basically we found that the, they're, they're very different um, populations. However, you'll notice that there are no samples on the boundary line from Sierra Leone and Liberia, and that's because of the Ebola outbreak. I couldn't go there to get samples, so we don't know how that boundary line will shift when eventually we have samples. So what you're looking at has a bunch of colored circles, and the circle size corresponds to the number of samples collected for each country. And then the colored um, pie slices inside are showing you the percentage of the different markers found in each place. So for the big colored circle at the bottom in Gabon, that's where we have the most genetic diversity. And that's likely because of a system of coastal lagoons where each lagoon's population has a different set of genetic markers, which means they've been in there for a very long time and are already evolved to be different from each other. And um, basically, all these different colors are somewhat like different flavors of ice cream. So um, if you think of ice cream, which I love, um, and you think of mint chocolate chip, it has chocolate chips. And then mocha chip also has chocolate chips. So you would consider those kinds of ice creams to be more similar than something like strawberry, which is a fruit ice cream. And that's really what we're looking at. Different, um, flavors of genetics that are of genetic markers that are either closer to related to each other or not. And so from this we're able to kind of identify these populations and also within uh, the northern population over there on the left side in Senegal, the Senegal River turns out to be a separate population. So all the navy blue that you see in that circle there are the manatees from the Senegal River. They're all exactly the same. They all have the same marker. They're not different. And that goes for the other gene that I studied as well, which tells us that, for example, if there was a catastrophic event that killed a lot of those manatees, they wouldn't have a lot of genetic diversity to help them. Um, in fact, they're a lot like Florida manatees that have very little genetic diversity, whereas the animals in Gabon have a lot more genetic diversity. The second, um, or sorry, the, the fourth small population I found is the Niger River, which you can't actually tell from this map, but the manatees in the Niger River are also a separate population. So basically, we have the coastal population populations and the riverine populations. And then for the feeding strategy um, study, basically um, I'm, I told you about the mollusks, but what I also learned um, when I went to Senegal and I was talking to people in the Senegal River, you can see the um, picture of the men holding catfish heads. And in the Senegal River, they were complaining that the manatees basically raid their nets. And when the catfish are caught, the manatees come along and suck the body of the catfish off the 
the body, leaving only the head and the net, which certainly doesn't endear them to the fishermen. And so they were claiming that the mantis ate um, fish, which I had heard in several other countries as well. And I, I was a little bit skeptical until that place where these fishermen showed me the catfish, simply because in that place, there were no other large predators. There were no crocodiles, there were no hippos, there were really nothing else, no big turtles that could eat these fish. So I was pretty sure it was mantis. So I did a technique called stable isotope analysis, which is a fancy way of saying I slogged through a lot of waterways, collecting plants and anything that I thought mantis were eating, and then compared it to manatee bone. And basically through some analyses, it tells me the percentage of um, different things in the mantis diet. And so all the other things you see in the other pictures, um, different fish species, estuarine clams, and freshwater mussels turned out to be things that these mantis were eating in different parts of Africa. And in fact, in, in Gabon, in Central Africa, where they have a lot of plants available, their diet is about 90% plants and 10% mollusks. But in Senegal, their diet's 50% fish and, and clams and 50% plants. And it doesn't matter either the coast or the river. So they are true omnivores, they're not herbivores, and that's a huge difference from other uh, manatee species, and that also means that we have to think differently about what is important habitat to protect for them. Some of the other work that we're doing is um, rescuing injured manatees or orphaned um, calves. Most of what we rescue is young animals who've been separated from their mom. Either uh, they just are alone or in one case their mom was killed by a hunter and so they were left as a dependent calf and we had to um, rescue it. We have raised one guy, the one with the bottle in the upper left is named Victor and we raised him for three years in a coastal lagoon before he was old enough to go free and he is now somewhere in the wilds of Gabon. Um, and then recently we've been able to uh, work with fishing communities to ask them to call us instead of killing manatees in nets. And the picture in the upper right was taken a month ago in Senegal when some fishermen called us and we were successfully able to rescue two adult manatees from fishing nets and release them. So we're making some slow progress in getting people to understand that they need to let these animals go. Um, and th these rescues are also a great training opportunity for some of the biologists that we work with. Um, another part, another project we started in 2013 is an alternative livelihood project. Um, if we're going to stop manatee hunting, we have to find other things for the hunters to do in order to earn a living. Uh, so this is my colleague Bolaji in the upper left who lives in Nigeria and he's had a fisheries background and he um, trained manatee techniques with me and so he came up with a great idea to teach aquaculture to a community in coastal Nigeria. Basically he went out and promised the manatee hunters, if you give up hunting, I will give you all the supplies you need uh, and teach you how to raise catfish in floating fish cages. I'll teach you how to market them. I'll teach you how to fertilize the eggs so you can con continue the process. And um, at first, the, some of them were, most of them were skeptical. But um, after the first few started and were successful, the other ones jumped on board. And so he's run 58 training programs to date um, and removed all manatee traps in that lagoon and uh, the former hunters have now raised and sold over a thousand pounds of catfish um, and the year before this project began they had killed 133 manatees in that community and they went to zero kills so that's a really exciting success story um, we have two other alternative livelihood projects um, one is in Senegal and one is in Mali but um, this one has been all the most successful so far and then our educational outreach program, um, we really believe that children are the future and we need to make them understand if they want this wildlife around for their own children later that we need to um, protect it now. So we do a lot of education programs. We've had over 50 programs a year, um, reaching 5,000 kids in, um, in five countries. And um, we've developed some materials to go with those programs, coloring books, posters, stickers, t-shirts, um, and the Manti costume. 
costume, which you heard about. And uh, we also do murals for public spaces to sort of be um, a daily reminder that it's important to protect manatees. Um, and so that's that's been pretty successful. We also do programs for adults as well. We don't leave the adults totally out. It's just that their minds are harder to change. So um, this is a very quick overview of some of the work that we're doing, but we are hopeful for the future that um, we are making a difference now in, in many countries. And this project would not be possible without the participation of some very dedicated African colleagues, only some of whom are shown here. Um, but I'm really thankful to have these folks to work with because um, they, they make it worth it every day. They're extremely dedicated, hardworking people. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, not only the New England Aquarium, but some of the other folks who fund this project. And if you are so inclined to help us after you hear Tomas's talk as well, um, I just thought I'd give you a few ideas. Um, we'd love for you to spread the word about the African Aquatic Conservation Fund. We have Facebook and Twitter pages. And if you really are excited and you'd like to come see our work firsthand, we are partnered with the Oceanic Society. And we have a trip to Senegal um, next March. We do one trip a year. Um, and we don't just see turtles and manatees. We see all kinds of wildlife, um, birds and wolves and other critters as well. Um, we also are trying to develop an internship program uh, for volunteers and interns. And um, we have a website if you'd like to learn more. So thank you so much for your attention. Tomas Stein has been working to save threatened and endangered turtle species in Senegal for over 20 years. He began rescuing endangered African spurred tortoises as a teenager. And in 1992, he created SOS, Save Our Sulcatas, a nonprofit organization. He co founded and built Tortoise Sanctuary in Rafisk, Senegal, a sanctuary and captive breeding facility for Salkata tortoise, tortoises that now houses over 300 individuals and has reintroduced numerous others back to the wild. In 2009, he began building the African Chelonian Institute project in order to expand turtle research, captive breeding, and reintroduction to all threatened African turtle species. Thomas is Tomas is actively involved in freshwater and rain turtle research throughout Africa, including both field research projects and captive reproduction of threatened freshwater and tortoise species in order to return them to the wild. Tomas is the regional vice chair for Africa for the rain turtle, the IUCN rain turtle specialist group and the tortoise and freshwater turtle specialist group, and an expert consultant of the UNEP CMS MOU for conservation of sea turtles the Atlantic coast of Africa, which is based in Dakar. He was also awarded a prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise in 1998. And in addition to all of that, Tomas speaks three languages. Please join me in welcoming Tomas to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm sorry, five languages. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, I think uh, the English and the French and a little bit of Spanish is the most useful. The other one is a survival uh, language I use in Africa in the field, but it's so useful. Uh, mm, good uh, evening. First, I would love to give all my appreciation to the people at the New England Aquarium who take care of us during this week of fellowship and uh, to give them all my appreciation about all the attention we have here and all the support we have from you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, for start, uh, I have to say, uh, I began to be interested on African Kelonian in 1993. But uh, my, uh, my first step to the world of conservation was for the Sulcara tortoise, the African spirit tortoise, who are a land tortoise species. And the uh, work I am presenting now is uh, uh, the marine turtle part of my work, who I started uh, in uh, 2000 uh, with uh, IUCN. Before we go any further, I know in the US, it is important to explain where is Senegal. <laughs> All the time I was starting to my talk, and at the end, the first question is, excuse me, mister, where is Senegal, your country? 
now I know this is the first things to do. <laughs> uh, you have the map, the worldwide map in the bottom. You have Africa, you have United States in yellow. You, you have uh, Africa in orange. And uh, you can see where in the map of Africa Senegal is. This is my country. I was born and raised in this country, where I uh, now is our base for us, uh, Lucy and me. And this is where we operate for trying to do our conservation work throughout Africa. Uh, now let's talk about sea turtle. I, I'm sure most of the people, uh, the person here know by visiting aquarium, by doing, listening to the news or uh, to the media, all the sea turtle worldwide are in trouble for various reasons. Uh, you, uh, you have different reasons, but the, I'm going to here talk about the most uh, uh, major reason of uh, the threats of the sea turtle. Uh, habitat development <laughs> is one of them. Uh, entanglement, oil spill, and also interaction. Sea turtle live in the sea, and uh, humankind like to go to the sea in order to find their seafood. And the interaction with the fishery and the animals, including sea turtle who live in the sea. Sea turtle not, no, uh, usually are not targeted for, for to be part of the seafood. But most of the time, uh, bycatch can be an issue. And that is why worldwide, most of the seven species of sea turtle in the world are now declining. This is the life cycle of sea turtle. Just uh, the important things to, I'm go not going to go to the details, but the important things uh, we need to, uh, you need to know is where sea, uh, the archling are born in the sea, they spend at least, uh, they swim. First of all, you have the predator who try to eat them. And if they are lucky, they get in the sea and start to swim quickly in order to reach the open ocean. This is where the, this stage is commonly named the lost year. Uh, this stage can be between, uh, 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 between uh, zero and 10 years before they reach, if they are lucky, if any other animals eat them, and they are, uh, in 10 years, they are going to reach the subadult stage and move back forward to reach the coastal area. Why they need to go to the coastal area? Because this is where they have their feeding ground, where they can continue to develop from subadult to adult. And they reach the adulthood when they are uh, around uh, uh, 30 years, 30 and 50 years. And after that, the female and the male move usually to the beach where they was born, like 25, 30 years ago. And this is where female and finally female and male meet and mate and when the female mate, uh, they, two weeks later, the female come back to the beach where she was born uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago to lay eggs. And this is the cycle. Uh, as you can see, sea turtle spend most of the time, his life cycle in the sea. 
that is something important to have on mind. And what's happened is, in Africa, most of the, the conservationists was working mostly to protect the nesting habitat. That is good to protect the, the nesting habitat because this is where the female come and lay their eggs. <laughs> but according to the previous side, when one animal spend 90% 90, uh, 90 of his time on the offshore, the best is to try to protect uh, the animals in the sea. That is why when I was first started, I see everybody in Africa who wanted to look good, go to the, uh, uh, for, uh, like uh, the turtle conservation is, are walk, was walking in the, in the beach. And I decided, okay, it's not maybe the way I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna change the strategy and try to develop more uh, strategy to protect uh, sea turtle in the uh, deep sea, like offshore. This is where the idea of the Senegal Stranding Network come. Uh, by receiving so many uh, information about stranded sea turtle in the northern coast in Senegal, we decided, Lucy, I, uh, Lucy and other colleagues, to launch the first Senegal Stranding Network in order to document the high mortality of sea turtle and other cetacean. I, as you can see in this picture, this uh, dolphin was butchered. This is a bycatch, but after that, the fisherman uh, uh, take uh, the meat, uh, butcher the animals and eat the meat. Turtle, unfortunately, in Africa, and dolphin are source of food. This is the main area of our survey, is the northern Senegalese, um, Senegal beach, the, is uh, 140 miles total in the northern beach. We need roughly three solid days to survey uh, by car, by four-wheel drive. And uh, uh, the four-wheel drive usually go to the speed limit of uh, 20 miles per hour because we need uh, uh, to focus and see how we can detect the car carcass. If we go too fast, it's not gonna be some, we are gonna miss something. We also conduct a survey in the southern part of Senegal, but not in the same way than we do in the north. Here, we try to train people mostly and get information back because the cost you have a lot of development in the coast, and we cannot. Uh, and also, you have uh, Gambia, who are in the middle of Senegal, uh, another country, uh, but uh, English-speaking country. I'm pretty sure most of the Americans will love to go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, we use another strategy like. Uh, mm, uh, capacity building for local people and local group who are involved in the fishery in order to get information about stranding. This is our team. The turtle team in the top, Mian Kader and Lucy Vim, who are in charge usually with the birds, and Jiba with Abdullah Jiba, Dr. Abdullah Jiba with the marine mammal. You see, take care of the database and the marine mammal too. And I always like to put these pictures inside the presentation about the car, because he's a member of the team. <laughs> uh, it's not our car, it's a rental car. In uh, uh, different, uh, we use a different um, rental company. So uh, most of the time we are not happy and we are not coming back. <laughs> And uh, when I see in the uh, U.S. The, how easy it is to go to enterprise or budget and rent a uh, mm, foil drive to go to the, mm, to the, to the field, I am just so envious. <laughs> First of all, in Africa, a rental car, particularly mm, 
four-wheel drive is so expensive, the rental company don't want you to go to the beach, <laughs> and we want to go to the beach. <laughs> and uh, the quality of the car are not really great. And most of the time, we need to have skills of mechanic when you are doing this kind of survey. <laughs> uh, this is a, another car, of course. <laughs> and uh, next to a dolphin, a stranded dolphin, and you can see also in the, um, in the top uh, doing a survey in the southern region and also uh, unpack well, a stranded unpack well with my colleagues. Uh, this is a green sea turtle uh, and always uh, with um, the team we are taking genetics, we are taking also biometrics like measurement and also we are collecting for most of the time the skull uh, for collection to our institute. You have pilot whale with kids. Uh, always uh, when we are doing the survey by seeing all these people around the dead animals, ki kids are always curious to know what guy you are doing here, what the hell you are doing here. And <laughs> we try to explain them, this is important to document uh, dead well, but they say they are already dead, why you need to document them? You are not eating them, Do why you document them? And this is where the discussion always begins and is always important to be able to share a little bit what we are doing with uh, local uh, kids and uh, also adults sometimes who are curious. This is the kind of bird my colleagues who are member of the team, the surrounding network team, the kind of bird he's always counting during uh, our trip. <coughs> to, to be honest, I love birds, but it's not really my... I, I know it's Sanderling because always I hear him saying Sanderling, Sanderling, but I cannot go more than more, more far than that. <laughs> and uh, when we see stranded animals, we try to, uh, the first of all, uh, before data collection, we try to document evidence of stranding, like they cut the flipper, uh, mostly because untangled animals uh, uh, in the nets. Fisherman always cut the flipper or the tail and release the dolphin on the sea turtle alive. And uh, the de death is a little bit painful, and that is really something really sad. And this is uh, the way we are taking, as I told you earlier, genetics measurement and school and bone for the collection. And the result of three years of uh, work, actually, because in 2014, we started in 2014 with only one survey. This is the result of uh, uh, the stranded survey. We are doing, sand, uh, we are doing survey four times uh, a year, quarterly, and uh, the, as you can see, uh, with just this small portion of beach, we have 127 dead sea turtle, different species, of course. But according to the statistic of uh, fishery, of people who work with bycatch, if you see one turtle wash ashore dead, you have five more who are dead offshore but cannot be visible because they drown or something like that. So you need to multiply this number by five or four in order to have the real average of the stranding. I think this is something really dramatic and someone need to take action. This is the result for the cetacean, different whale, and dolphin we have during all these uh, these three years of survey uh, you see in uh, 
in June and July, this is where we have, we ha you have dif different color, like a sea turtle in green, small cetacean in uh, red, and in blue, large whale. And you see how uh, uh, the seasonality of uh, the stranded, usually, this is, uh, is uh, during the raining season, we have the most higher percentage of stranded. And now we are trying to work with the fishery to understand why. Uh, this is a satellite, uh, satellite map of uh, what's uh, happened uh, in the offshore in the night. Uh, each yellow dots mean the activity of fishery, like the industrial fishery. Because on night, usually uh, artisanal fishermen are back. You have here only the activity of the industrial fishery who are, go, uh, who are coming to the coast of West Africa and taking the fish. And that is why uh, we suspect also this is the main reason why we have uh, this high mortality of sea turtle in this region. Also, the artisanal fishermen, like this picture in Joel in central coastal uh, Senegal, where when uh, mostly when fishermen catch sea turtle, they say it always is accidental, is by catch. I'm not making my 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 mm, my day by catching sea turtle. But when they catch it, they don't release it and they eat the meat, or maybe they kill the turtle and sell the meat. This is the picture of uh, the one male sea turtle, green sea turtle, who was using for uh, to sell the meat, butcher to sell the meat. And as you can see, they use also uh, the penis for uh, aphrodisiac, as usual. Uh, what we can do with all this information, what we can do to just try to uh, uh, do something meaningful for African turtle conservation. First of all, train collaborator. I, we started to train collaborator in different country about natural theory, conservation and monitoring technique throughout West Africa mostly. Uh, this is a training also, another picture of training for our colleague in Central Coastal Senegal and in Benin. Another thing we can do is uh, protect the nesting site of uh, sea turtle, like uh, what my colleague Castro Barbosa is doing in Guinea-Bissau, where you have pollen island, uh, usually in this small island for 15 hectares, you have 3,000 female uh, green sea turtle who comes each year lay the eggs. This is uh, really important, this is the mecca of sea turtle. If you want to get inspired about sea turtle, please go there. <laughs> and where we want to impact sea turtle conservation is use all this information to, uh, mm, to uh, let evolve the policy, fishery policy in Senegal and West Africa. One of the solution we can propose during our dialogue with the Senegal Fishery Service and Authority is with all the data we have in all this year, you know now the stranding is not occasional. It's something really important and massive. Now what we can do is use the TED, like you can see the trawler can use the TED, the total slider device where sea turtle can be excluded when they get caught by the net, but the fish or the shrimp can stay in the uh, net. And we understand the economic value for all this fishery, but we just want some species, dolphin, ray, and sea turtle who are not targeted to have uh, their life safe. And uh, the other activity we are doing in order to reduce, uh, uh, to conserve sea turtle in this country is education. Uh, kids are the future for Africa, for 
U.S. for everywhere in the world. Giving them proper education is important. This is the really uh, one important component where we always want to impact turtle conservation. During festival, during uh, uh, visit in our breeding facility, in also people come, uh, we are visiting school to provide also the information for, to promote sea turtle conservation. And it's not something who are gonna happen overnight. We know that. I always say we need to work in the future. We need to believe on the future in order to make change. But someone needs somewhere to put the seed in the ground. And we are putting the seed in the ground. And I'm going to hand my talk always with this kind of statement. This is a Baba Jum, uh, a Senegalese uh, conservationist who said in 1968 during the meeting of IUCN, he made a really strong statement about education, why education is important, particularly for Africa. In the hand, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we have been taught. That is a, just a strong message. I would like to thank you for your attention. And thanks also all our funders, SWAT, NOAA Fishery, of course, Marine Total Conservation Fund, well, Marine Conservation, Total Conservation Fund at the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Marine Conservation Act Action Fund at uh, the New England Aquarium. Thank you so much. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> Um, have you ever considered or had the opportunity to do any tagging of the animals? I'm thinking particularly for you, you had the, the young ones that you were able to rescue. I'm wondering, with the open ocean interest that Tomas has, if that's something you've been able to do. So Tanya's question is, have we ever been able to tag any of the animals that we work with? Um, we have tagged some manatees in Senegal that we rescued from behind an agricultural dam. I didn't talk about it tonight because there's just so many things I could go over in 20 minutes. But um, we did satellite tag three manatees in the Senegal River, and we learned a lot from them. Um, they used about 268 kilometers of the river um, and um, used portions of the river we didn't know manatees went to. Um, so we, we have learned a lot. We have not uh, tagged the young calves that we've released yet simply because the tags were developed for Florida manatees, which are much larger. And so it would sort of be like strapping a 75 pound weight to your ankle and telling you to go on with your life. Um, it would just be too challenging for them. But more recently, the tag sizes have been made smaller. And we would like to be able to tag animals in the future to see where they go. Yep. And he can talk about turtles. <laughs> yeah, but for me, tagging turtle is uh, most of the turtle I encounter is a dead turtle. <laughs> tagging dead turtle is going to be something really not really useful. But uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, my colleagues uh, uh, Castro Barbosa in Guinea Bissau who are working to the in the. A nesting beach, a nesting uh, habitat of sea turtle already tagged two female sea turtle to see after they lay the eggs where they go. And uh, this study was uh, really interesting because after that we understand where the female sea turtle after laying the eggs go and, uh, and in the region of West Africa. And uh, this study was conducted uh, like five years ago and that was a really great information for us to connect all the puzzle we need to put together in order to have valuable information to save the adult sea turtle. Uh, that is the only um, information I have uh, about the tagging sea turtle. And actually I just thought of one other thing though. We, um, we were contacted by a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal who saw some fishermen butchering a turtle that had a tag. And he I was able to register 
memorize the number of the tag because they wouldn't let him take a picture. And that turtle turned out to be a loggerhead sea turtle that was tagged in Florida and had gone across the Atlantic, nested in Cape Verde Islands, and then swum to Senegal where it was killed. So these turtles in Senegal are coming from other parts of the world. We know that. Um, there are also leatherbacks documented in South America that come to Africa to nest. So it truly is global, these turtles. So even though we only have some limited information, we do know they're coming from other places. So, yeah, thank you. I know you said that you do stable isotope analysis, but do you also do some stable isotope analysis on the dead turtles that you find? Uh, we, we, are, we are collecting genetics. Yeah, they don't do this. Yeah, we, we, we don't do that. They, this is too fancy for Africa. <laughs> this is for America. <laughs> but uh, not uh, for sea turtle, because for sea turtle right now, sea turtle are the level of information about sea turtle, their foraging area, their diet, and all these things are really well known. It's different to the manatee. A manatee is a forgotten species. At least you have a lot more where to go than me. For me, I know exactly what is the diet of the sea turtle in their adulthood, uh, in their uh, juvenile stage, and all these things. Um, which, uh, which isotopes do you focus on? Carbon-15? Uh, okay, carbon so she's asking which isotopes I, I focus on. I'm, car I'm focusing on carbon-13 and nitrogen-15, yeah. Those are the two most valuable for looking at e ecological processes. Yeah, yeah. I also do cool. use those. Yeah. Mm. Esther. <laughs> so I have a question for Tomas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, about your surveys. Because uh, obviously you're using a car to do the surveys on the beach. So the, my question, my first question is, how do you know that you are not going to go over any sea turtle nest that might be in the beach uh. and that is not obvious at a distance? But repeat, repeat the question. Mm? She repeat the question. She repeat the question. <laughs> Esther is asking. <laughs> we need to. They can't hear. Um, she's asking when we do the surveys how we know we're not driving over any sea turtle. Ah, uh, yeah, nests. I understand now. I understand. <laughs> you know. It's okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Nests, right? Okay. Uh, this work is focused not in the sea turtle nest because. Um, uh, the main focus of this project is to document the stranding. So that's why we don't maybe, we historically know this area is not really good for sea turtle nests. You have sporadically two or maybe five nests around, but it's not something we want to focus on. We want to focus on documenting the stranding of the sea turtle and other mama. Also, the nests are, if there were nests, they would be higher up on the beach because we're driving at the low tide line right at the shoreline. So there wouldn't be nests right there at the water line. Yep. Over there. Uh, this message for Tomas. Has the fishing nets uh, been successful? And if so, like, um, how many of the fishing boats use those, uh, the, the fishing nets uh, you know, for the, to do uh, so he's asking if the fishing nets with the excluder devices have been successful. Um, we haven't actually been able to get the government to implement those yet. So that's where we're trying to go. Okay. Um, so we, they don't have excluder devices right now. Um, turtle excluder devices have been successfully implemented in Nigeria and Gabon. And so we're hoping that that precedent will help us um, convince the Senegalese government that it's the right thing to do. Uh, this is about funding. I mean, all of this obviously costs money, and maybe most of your funding comes from. And is there any funding available from Africa itself so that they realize the value of what you're doing? Um, he's asking where um, our funding comes from and if there's um, any funding from Africa itself. Um, not much. <laughs> so most of our funding comes from um, either the United States or Europe, um, foundations, governments, um, and sometimes private donations. But uh, we are trying to work with different companies that work in Africa for corporate sponsorship, um, because there are some pretty big companies like Total Gas and Fage, which is a French highway company uh, that's building the international, uh, sorry, the, the highway in Senegal right now um, that have environmental funds. So we are hoping that we 
might be able to get some corporate sponsorship. But generally, it's, it's difficult to get money from African governments for, or really anyone, for work like ours. Any other questions? Oh, there. I was wondering how successful the educational programs have been, and have you seen much success? So she's asking how successful the education programs have been. Um, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> um, so we um, have done an evaluation program for Mantis in, in Gabon. Um, one of my graduate student who's working on her education master's um, works with 14 schools and 4,000 students in central Gabon. And she, um, when she started, she went into the schools and she asked each child to draw a picture of their favorite protected species in its natural habitat. And she gave them a little card that showed what the protected species in the country were. And some of the kids drew elephants and gorillas. But the kids that drew manatees, every single child drew the manatee being killed. Because that's how they know manatees. They were either in a net, or they were being harpooned, or their head was getting cut off. And so basically, that's where she started from. And so after a year of the education program, she went back. Um, I think it was six weeks after the last program, she went back to the school and did the same activity, asked the kids to draw um, the same animal now, and every kid drew a happy nanty with flowers and trees and the sun um, and living peacefully. So we, you know, that's just sort of a, a snapshot of the kinds of difference that we do see, because when the kids learn um, that it's not just a food item and it's something important um, to protect, um, that does make a difference. Um, Additionally, you know, we, it's, it's very difficult in, in places in Africa where it's poor. So um, one of the ways that we try to convince people is, you know, I'll ask someone, so you enjoy manatees in whatever way that you enjoy them. Don't you want your grandchildren to have them as well? And of course they do. So they say yes, and I say, okay, well then this is what we have to do. We have to learn to protect them um, so that there are enough for the future. So it's, a, it's quite different than from an American audience where people have a, an empathy for animals most of the time. Um, but it, it does seem to hit a, a nerve with them that, you know, yes, I want the future to have these animals. So you, so you think you're getting, you're making headway? In the park? I do, actually. Um, the kids are really enthusiastic. I mean, kids naturally like animals, and um, they seem to be, uh, they, you know, they seem to understand that they want to protect them. So we hope that, as Tomas said, it's a very long-term uh, project because we need that generation to grow up. Um, but, you know, as someone was saying today, if, if a kid really realizes as a child that they love this animal, they're, they might influence their parents. Like, I don't want to eat manatee meat anymore. Um, so, you know, then their parents may think twice, or at least when they grow up, they're not as willing to, to eat it. Yeah. Is that the same with the sea turtle, or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a matter of working on it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I have two food questions. Um, the first one is, is in Florida, have they noticed the manatees eating fish and, and clams down there? Because the water is, is actually easier to <laughs> view what they're doing, especially yeah. in the Tampa coastal ways and stuff. Um, have they noticed a, a change in their diet? And um, the second question is, is when we're telling the African um, kids and, and families and stuff that, that we're not going to eat these animals anymore, I know that with you, they did the, the thing with the, um, the catfish, but are they doing other um, items like that, how to like grow and raise their own food, as opposed to, I know that the environment there is a big contributor, and there is a lot of hunger and neediness there right. that they go to the resources to get, and as much as I love the animals, sometimes they need to Right. The people, so I was just curious on that. Okay, so two questions. One, are the people working with Florida mantis seeing them eating fish and, and clams in their diet? I'll answer that one first. Um, not really much. There are some reports. Um, there was a report of mantis in Jamaica actually eating fish back in the 1970s, and occasionally they're seen eating sort of tunicates off dock pilings. Um, but in Florida, they um, can necropsy most of the mantis that die, and they don't see it in the stomachs. They just 
Um, if they do see something, it's very occasional and they assume that it might be a dead fish that was on the bottom that the mantee kind of snarfled up as it was eating the grass. So um, it is very definitely not a main food source like it is in Africa. Um, and that goes to the Amazon uh, Amazonian mantis as well. They're pretty much um, plant eaters and the stable isotope work has been done on those species and they don't see it. Um, then so perhaps they did it because they, they're they're evolving in their, what they have access to. So if right, I know, right. I think that they're doing it because it's a good protein source in, in a, a place where they may not have other options. And then the second question was um, just blanking. Um, it was right, it was about the aquaculture in Nigeria and um, and do they, although we did that one project, do the people um, not hunt? So the, the point of that is that the, we actually trained the hunters. There are other people with other livelihoods, like farmers and fishermen who aren't hunting manatees. So we really just trained the hunters to do the aquaculture. Um, I think it's, it's fairly sustainable. They actually realized that they're making more money doing the aquaculture and they have a more consistent income over time. If you're a manatee hunter, you're basically out there waiting to kill a manatee and you may or may not get one for a long period of time. Whereas if you're raising catfish, you know when your catfish are going to grow up and be ready to go to market, you know what your income is going to be. Um, and all of them um, say that their income is better as catfish farmers. In my head, I'm visualizing the manatees thankful that you're raising catfish because they now you have the catfish farmers who are actually seeing their 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 uh, their catfish going to the manatees that they're saving. It's just oh in my head. well, no, they can't get their catfish because they're in big cages. Yeah, they don't eat their catfish. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, uh, when you were doing the pie charts of the different like genes. Um, yep manatees what specific genes are you like looking for to good question I guess categorize them okay her question is what genes am I looking at for the genetics so that um, picture with the pie charts was all one gene and it's called control region it's a mitochondrial gene and the other one that I'm studying is the cytochrome B so I'm guessing you know your genetics so <laughs> <laughs> two common genes and the reason I picked those is because those are the ones that the people studying the other manatee species had already used so that allows me to compare what we're learning for Africa with the Florida manatee and the Amazonian manatee and I actually did another study that um, looked at when they all um, evolved um, sort of separated out from an ancestor so that's how I know that the African manatee is most closely related to the one in Florida because we can see that through the genetics. So, just speaking of the evolution, would you say that one population started on one side of the earth and then moved, or did they evolve separately in a very similar way? Um, actually, all of the manatees, um, the, the family of trichicids, evolved likely in the Columbia region of South America. Um, that's where they, they seem to have radiated out from, um, and so. Um, I, it would take me longer <laughs> than I have right here to explain, but um, what we see is the Amazonian manatee diverged first, and that has to do with the uplifting of the Andi Andes Mountains. Five million years ago, they sort of went that way into the Amazon River, and then the other ones that were in the coast um, up in the Caribbean uh, spread out through the Caribbean up to Florida, and then um, eventually the, there were some that sort of swam down the coast of the north coast of South America, and um, um, my own research, I found that they went to Africa between three and five million years ago during the Pleistocene, which is um, the last time the Earth is as warm as it's getting. And uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, I found a lot of um, reasons why, what might have aided that, and basically it has to do with warmer oceans and ocean currents. There was basically a current that pretty much could have conveyor belted them right over to Africa. So um, that's my theory, that they, they went on that conveyor belt about three to five million years ago. Okay, last question. Someone that has an answer. How do you? Um, is climate change affecting the manatee population? That's a good question. Is climate change affecting the manatee population? Um, 
You know, in some ways, climate change isn't all bad for them because they're a tropical species, and as it gets warmer, they, they can move out. But um, the problem for them is in places that they live now, for example, the Senegal River, it's getting hotter and drier, and that population may disappear from where it is because of um, the desertification that's, that's happening there. Um, there's a lot of other things like um, the, the human side of you know population growth and the coastal areas and stuff that coupled with climate change may not be so good for manatees but um, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna learn something fast enough to be able to preserve them so thank you all so much for coming we'll be in the lobby if you'd like to chat.